question we are trying to address today is, will the US Navy NGAD program be an adequate reply to the Chinese Type 003 and 004 aircraft carriers and their sophisticated air wing? Well, sophisticated, that's what we expect it to be. The Navy and its carriers will be key for sustained operations in the Western Pacific in case of a confrontation. There will be plenty of asymmetric threats in that environment. But today we focus on the potential symmetric confrontation between the Chinese carriers, their carrier wing and the future US Navy carrier wing. Why is this important? Well, the stakes are incredibly high for both opponents. The price of inadequacy will be failure and defeat if an armed confrontation should happen. Let's hope not. I have many friends on both sides. You're right, Otis. Let's hope not. Let's really hope. The necessary caveat is that we know very little about the Navy and GAD, which is at an even earlier stage than the Air Force and GAD. But if you follow the channel, you know that the progress of the Chinese is not much more advanced. I'm trying to piece together what little information is available and I'm using some analysts' consideration as a starting point. But this video is going to be a speculative one. The NGAD program is a family of systems that should fly from the decks of US carriers and amphibian ships in the third decade of this century. The main component is the FAXX, a piloted platform that is going to replace the F-18EF. The other components are a series of unmanned platforms that are going to cover various roles. The MQ-25, the tanker drone that is entering service now, is just the first of these platforms, albeit is not formally part of the NGAD program. There will be ISR platforms, electronic warfare, uh, OWACs, weapon trucks, combat drones, and so on. The piloted element will act as an orchestrator of all these assets, and the future carrier air wing will be a mix of piloted and unmanned platforms. And this is a concept known as your mom. This is totally out of place, sir. Well, MUM comes into play with the concept of mum T, manned and unmanned teaming. This is the possibility to combine the manned and unmanned uh, platform operations and do it seamlessly. Algorithms have improved substantially in the last 10 years and the so-called artificial intelligence will have a big part in it. However, artificial intelligence is not ready to become the loyal wingman that is so often mentioned in the news. This is still probably a decade or two away. However, vehicles capable of autonomous choices are becoming increasingly common and their importance for military operation is increasing as well. There are several advantages to a system that could operate with some degree of autonomy. It is not only going to be smaller, lighter, cheaper than a manned system, but it also decreases the information workload for the decision makers, which are usually human. An unmanned system is also easier to sacrifice to safeguard other interests, and this creates the category of the attritable assets. Yes, this is new military speak. For now, the current unmanned vehicles are capable of autonomous behaviors upon receiving commands or when they are disconnected from their controlling platforms. For example, an MQ-25 tanker can be controlled by another aircraft and that could be an E2DO Kai because the management is basically limited to identifying where the tanker orbit is going to be. After that, the tanker will operate autonomously, refueling the customers with no human intervention. However, the aircraft can evade a threat if it is notified of its existence, or it can decide to come back to the carrier when communications are cut or at the end of the mission. Combat vehicles are also expected to be capable of deciding if it is the case to keep executing the missions 
or returning to base in case the communications are cut, they are discovered or they are attacked. The flip side of this approach in an air combat environment is that the pilot of the man component is going to be more a manager than a pilot. The aircraft must fly itself while the pilot is doing other stuff like using the sensors or managing the other elements of the mix. But artificial intelligence as it is now will have a huge impact on military operations. The US Navy carrier group of the future is going to change radically from what it is now. The current take of the Navy about the F-35 is to replace some of the Super Hornets with it. But it is not going to replace everything in the medium term. The carriers will operate with one or two squadrons of F-35Cs to execute those missions where very low observability is actually relevant. Moreover, using their excellent electronic suite, they will cover part of the electronic surveillance and electronic warfare roles. In a way similar to what the FAXX is explicitly designed to do, the F-35Cs will be used to coordinate mixed packages of F-18, Growlers and other F-35s. However, this equilibrium is not going to last very long because the FAXX is going to replace the remaining F-18 Super Hornets. So far it makes sense, this is sort of a standard rotation policy, but there is something that doesn't sound right. If the NGAD is a family of systems, where are going to be all these other systems? Where are they going to be housed on the carrier? From the sources I could access, it also seems that this condition of equilibrium between F-35 and FAXS is going to be temporary. In fact, the carrier wing of the future is expected to be 60% piloted and 40% unmanned. And this proportion should gradually reverse to become 40 and 60. This is a condition that will be probably reached by the 50s of this century with the progressive decommissioning of the F-35. Considering that unmanned vehicles are going to be smaller than manned ones, we can expect to have a carrier wing composed by 2025 piloted assets and 30-40 unmanned vehicles plus the usual panoply of support aircraft. When I read this for the first time, some elements actually clicked together, but probably I'm going ahead of me. The next question is, precisely what kind of drones are going to fly from the carriers? MQ-25 is entering service as a tanker, but it is doubtful that the same airframe could be adapted to become a combat capable. Despite being a moderately low observability aircraft, its long and straight wing is clearly optimized for efficiency at subsonic speed and loitering. It doesn't look suited for speed and maneuvering. The intake at the top of the fuselage is in the worst place for air combat maneuvers or any kind of abrupt maneuver in general. One possibility, though, uh, maybe an intermediate possibility, is an OAX variant of the aircraft. The current package on board of the E2 is definitely too large and too power hungry to be transferred to the MQ-25, but smaller solutions already exist, like those in use with helicopters. So while the MQ-25 is a valuable addition to the carrier wing, it's probably not decisive. I was among those puzzled when I saw the Navy shelving the X-47B after demonstrating excellent capabilities. However, it seems to me that this hesitancy has been abandoned by the Navy because the NGAD program explicitly mentions the presence of UCAVs together with piloted aircraft. So what are these UCAVs going to be? Since the configuration of the NGAD program is still being designed uh, together with the FAXX, we still don't have the specifications, we can only speculate about these systems. To me, it seems reasonable to consider two variants, a weapon truck or a combat variant if you want, and an ISR slash electronic warfare platform. They will be built on a single airframe much more similar to the X-47 
than to the MQ-25. The reason being, this aircraft will have to be performance comparable with the piloted aircraft. It seems reasonable that the weapon carrier will have a modern multifunction radar, but it will likely rely heavily on passive electronic support measures and infrared sensors. And it will be capable of using fire solutions provided by other elements of the mix. For stealth reasons, it will necessarily feature a weapon bay, but it will be capable of a respectable external payload. It will need to be refueled in flight, and in this case will be interesting to see a drone refueling another drone. It probably won't have the same exact performance of the FAXX, but it surely needs to be capable of cruising with it. So, for example, is the FAXX will be capable of super cruising, which is likely, so will be the drone. The ISR and electronic warfare variant is probably going to be a bit more complex. Yes, because one of the problems on a small airframe could be power generation. A modern radar like the APG-81 can be used for discovery and even for jamming up to a point, but it requires quite a lot of power. If the aircraft will also feature dedicated jammers, then it will need to have some form of electrical power generation other than the engine. But these requirements will collide with the necessity of remaining stealth, so probably integral antennas and smart skins will be extensively used. Like the weapon struct, it should be capable of cruising with the FAXX, and it should also be capable of carrying a limited number of weapons for self-defense. Both UCAVs will be capable of some autonomous decisions in case they remain isolated. We may also expect some level of tactical intelligence, for example the capability of prioritizing the menaces and the order of their engagement. In these algorithms there will be the strength and the weakness of the system. There is no doubt that they will be extremely efficient, but a human can access the general situation much better and act accordingly. Autonomous decisions are hardly going to have the same level of insight that a human may have. What is certain though is that networking all the sensors together is the necessary prerequisite to fully use all the effectiveness of this approach. So secure and reliable data links with high bandwidth will be a must. But this is probably the area where less progress is needed because the Navy and other services have already developed various waveforms and data links with an adequate bandwidth and an adequate resilience. As I said, this is a speculation video and this kind of picture seems feasible to me. But now it's time to speak about the FAXX. The Navy's interpretation of the FAXX is different from the Air Force and GAD. While the Air Force is going for a full science fiction approach, the Navy is having a more measured and level-headed approach. This is because at the core there are a few fundamental differences. While the Air Force is going for an air dominance mission with a secondary air-to-ground role, the Navy is going straight for multi-role operations. The number of units on board of the carrier is going to steadily decrease, either because the new aircraft are going to be larger or because they won't be procured in large numbers, so there is no room for specialized platforms. While the Air Force wants to operate within range of lethal threats with impunity, the Navy focuses on long-range standoff operations, either air-to-air, -air, air to ground or anti-ship. Nobody in the world is so obsessed with stealth as the United States Air Force, and even the US Navy doesn't share the same philosophy. The FAXS will surely be stealth, but it won't be much more stealth than current 5th generation aircraft. 
So it is probably going to look like a recognizable aircraft and not something totally alien as probably the Air Force and GAD is going to be. Indeed, it will have a long range. The focus is still on the Pacific and the F-18 is not really known to have very long legs. The F-35C is an improvement, but a very long range is only going to be beneficial. We may expect a range with no refueling around 1200 to 1400 nautical miles. And this is probably achievable with the new generation of variable cycle engine already being developed by Pratt & Whitney and General Electric. To be honest, the Navy is a bit skeptical about this technology, but I don't see any other alternative. The long range for air-to-air -air combat will likely be provided by the new AIM-260, which is going to enter service in late 2022 or early 2023. It will have the same form factor as an AMRAM, but it will have a longer range. There are other long-range air-to-air weapons in development, uh, but we know almost nothing about those. The cue to these weapons will require a powerful radar of the class of an improved APG-81 or something more similar to the British-Italian MFRS, the, the radar that is being prepared for the Tempest. However, we may expect that passive sensors are going to become more and more critical. An advanced DAS or an advanced Erst are probably going to be developed. Direct energy weapons will still probably be out of reach, but systems that do fry the optical sensors of incoming missiles already exist, so we may expect that those will be used. It is easy to speculate that the El Rasm missile will be the main weapon for anti-ship roles. The aircraft base and potentially the drones base will need to be sized to house an adequate number of these missiles. We may also expect a variant of this weapon capable of attacking ground targets, or maybe an evolved variant of the Slam ER, or, well, we can't exclude there is something else in the brewing. Beyond that, it is only reasonable to suppose that the usual panoply of American weapons are going to be integrated. So, FAXX, drones, how are they going to operate together? Or, more importantly, how are they going to fare against a Chinese air wing? We have already dedicated various videos to the Chinese Type 003 and potential 004, and this video is already long enough, so I invite you to go and watch those videos. Link above and below. So if we watch from a distance the two carrier wings, well, their structure and mission, let's say in the late 30s, is probably going to be not that different. It will include fifth generation piloted aircraft and an established presence of UCAVs. From the point of view of the UCAVs, it seems that China is slightly ahead of the US now because the GJ-11 is already in operational service. A naval version hasn't been seen yet, but the Chinese are definitely porting the technology to the carriers and potentially smaller vessels. It seems that the aircraft now is less sophisticated than the drones we have just speculated about, but the platform is there, is working, it is operational, while the United States only have some prototypes. The main problem of the GJ-11 in this context is that the aircraft is subsonic, so it may not be suited to accompany the other manned aircraft in all their missions. In terms of piloted aircraft, the Chinese wing will probably be a mix of J-35s and a naval version of J-20. Both these platforms will likely suffer a generational gap with the FAXX. However, they will probably have the advantage of not requiring a long unrefueled range because they will be operating closer to their bases and closer to ground-based assets. Furthermore, it is only expected that the Chinese are going to quickly develop and release new variants of these aircrafts because that's what they always do. For example, the Chinese are really investing a lot on AISA radars. In the air-to-air -air domain, the Chinese today are ahead with the PL-12 and the PL-15. 
This gap should be recovered by the AIM-260, which actually was designed exactly because there was this inferiority. The Chinese have several options for the anti-ship mission, but none with the LRASM features. But as usual, considering the speed at which the Chinese are churning out new weapons, we may expect that something like that is going to appear soon. So overall, in the late 30s of this century, an American carrier group will probably have a technology advantage on a Chinese carrier group, which is good, but this is no guarantee of success. As I said at the beginning, a US carrier group in a potential confrontation with China will face several asymmetric threats, some of them well beyond the reach of a present or a future American carrier group. In a sort of sportsman-like comparison between the two fleets, probably the Americans will have an advantage. But this hardly happens in real life. I think that the only thing that we can do is wait and see. Thank you for watching this far, I really appreciate that. And if you are interested in the Chinese military, the Chinese Navy, we have, there are several videos on the channel and they're going to appear beside me. Thank you to all those who are supporting the channel by being a member or on Patreon. And I remind you, if you would like to support the channel, there is a new way you can buy an aircraft model by Air Models. There will be an affiliate link below. I get a small percentage to no extra cost to you. So thank you very much for watching and see you there.